back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your regular host, Greg Carr, and here's where we spend our weekly hour devoted to topics of particular interest to people of African descent and to others working to build a better society. Uh, today, we continue our work of intergenerational conversation with representative thinkers from across the world. And you know, we've had some giants in this space over the arc of our short time on the air. Um, one particularly comes to mind, two actually, one an African born in the United States, another African born in West Africa, uh, Gerald Horn and Toyin Falola. Um, we have a brother who is, in the words of one of his great teachers, James Turner, um, is really at the center of his generation, which is my generation, our generation of thinkers and workers in the struggle to build a better world. And that's none other than Baba Kwasi, uh, Baba Kwasi Kanadu. Kwasi Kanadu, Dr. Kanadu, um, is a number of things. He is a healer. He's a scholar. He's a publisher. He's a master teacher. He is a son, a grandson, a father. He is a husband, a practitioner, and he is a an obosomfo. Now, I know if I, my tree doesn't exist, so he's going to correct me in a moment. <laughs> uh, his, his most recent academic appointment was at Colgate University. Um, he served there as the John Catherine MacArthur Chair. Uh, he taught across the disciplines, rooted firmly in Africana studies. And we're going to hear about his life, his journey, his work. And so get your young people in particular to come to this session at the black table because you're going to learn a lot about how to move through the world as a representative thinker and as, as a fighter for a better world so we are honored here at the black table to welcome our brother kwasi kanadu welcome prof how you doing i'm doing great i'm great thank you for having me uh, with great pleasure brother we hope to have you back over and over again you say you um you have made it back to uh as Elijah Muhammad would say the hells of north america but you just came back from a few places huh where where, where have you been brother well, the beginning of this month of March, um, I spent about two weeks in Ghana uh, working with some folks on the ground, um, actually um, some great people who were uh, working with young people, both um, men, young men and women uh, through the auspices of sports, in particular uh, U.S. football. And so what was really um, cool was that um, uh, shout out to uh, my brother, um, Yao Usu Kromoa. Uh, he plays for the Cleveland Browns, and he and some um, other brothers that organize um, these camps um, that essentially use football as a way to teach um, these important life skills, values, um, cultural values, actually. In fact, um, during the uh, flag football teams, all the teams had representative ancestors from Nambui Nehanda to Milpaka Brawl to Kwame Nkrumah, and you, you name it, Ose Tutu, Ya Santua. And so basically, um, th this brother uh, that I speak of, Yao, um, really is, uh, has a lot of foresight uh, for a brother who's in his early 20s uh, to be able to use uh, the mechanism of, of football to really engender these sort of cultural competencies and leadership skills and uh, this type of work ethic that's required in, in order to not only survive, but thrive uh, in this world that we live in. Uh, and of course, to be rooted, of course, in ancestry. So uh, I was honored to be a part of that group. Um, I also had a chance to be sort of a, um, I would say tour guide, but cultural uh, ambassador and translator uh, for the group as we moved our way from Kakra to Kumasi and then Oko to Techiman further north, came back down. So it was, was really a great two weeks of just building with those um, you know, folks that he knew, which became my people now, but also the young people that were part of these camps that were so energetic, so enthusiastic, and really um, put a lot of effort and work into um, the camps. And I think those relationships, I think, will last a long time. In fact, we plan to do it again next year as well. And so as soon as I came back from, from Ghana, uh, around mid-March, um, a week later, I, I was in Jamaica <laughs> to see my father. and. You know, to do some 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 work with some folks down there, and I just came back actually a few days ago. Oh man, that's wonderful! So as we were saying before we started, you uh you've been home and you've been home home. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but right. before, before we go any further though, and we really you know this is a, a unique opportunity. Um, I didn't mention you all here at the table that I did mention that he's an author, of course, and and a, and a remarkably prodigious scholar. Uh, many of your books, whether it be the Akan Diaspora in the Americas or Akan Pioneers or your two volume documentary work around the Akan people um, 
and certainly connected to your blood ancestors uh, there in Jamaica. And so if you don't mind, uh, Bob, I know I introduced a word um, that you uh, are known by and a title that you're known by as uh, Obosonfo. Uh, I know I'm butchering it, so you'll, cl you'll, you'll clear it up for us. But also your people, uh, your Akapong side, the Jamaican side, the Maroon side, uh, you have a, a, a healer background and tradition so maybe if you don't mind saying a, two, a couple of words about that a kind diaspora as you have lived in and are part of it as part of the jamaican diaspora sure thing so what happened something happened to me this past december i was in brazil i was in salvador da bahia and um, the reason i was there was because um uh, my spirit um told me to to go there and come to find out that I not only have uh, a very strong anchoring within a Khan ancestry that is within the confines of the Republic of Ghana today, but also ancestry from Benin, what is now Benin anyway. And so, um, you know, I carry as well the, um, the a very old, uh, ancient, I would say, um, uh, African spiritual force um, known popularly as Shango but is rooted in, in in a very more ancient you know formation of um, that precedes Dahomey and those formations in West Africa. For those who are watching or will watch, uh, and are familiar with West African history over the last you know thousand years or so, and so come to find out that um, you know my my circuit in terms of you know who I am as a package of my ancestry um, also spans um, these folks from what is now Benin, and so Benin and Ghana. Not so much a nation state, but the people who inhabit those places are very much tucked into, you know, this package that um, is really formed or constitute, you know, who I am. And so um, in that constellation of people, uh, I come from through my mother's line, which is how I trace my ancestry. Uh, I come from really a long line of, of healers. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather was a healer and who's, he's the one who I was reared with when I was born and raised uh, in the island of Jamaica. And um, then my grandmother's mother, my great grandmother was also a healer. It skipped my grandmother because she became a Pentecostalist and lost her mind. <laughs> and so um, then my great, great grandmother was also a healer and her mother was a healer. And her mother mm. is the one that I've come to know as Ajwa Kunadu, and that's how I get my name. Yes. Um, and she's the one that was um, brought from the then Gold Coast, present day Ghana, um, to uh, the island of Jamaica, and she's the one that marooned. And so she had joined the Kampong group in the western part of the island in the parish of what is now St. Elizabeth, um, but way up in the mountains. Um, and so um, that ancestry really is just filled with, you know, these, these women, but also men, you know, that have this ability to be able to see differently and hear differently, and also to communicate with these forces of nature, energies of nature, really, because human beings are simply just interplay energy and matter, right? And so um, we're all connected in this sort of broader circuit, but there are those that have the ability not to see worse or better, but just different and hear differently and be able to use those uh, forces, you know, for therapeutic uses, for healing, but also for defense. Because um, I don't want to make people think that this is all uh, about harmony. It's also about, you know, war. And so many of my Maroon ancestors use those spiritual forces, weaponize them, in fact, uh, against um, British, French, and other uh, European empire seekers and colonists during the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Uh, but even after you know, you know that period, you know those those energies and that work, that healing work, continued, you know, um, on the island, and of course, it found its way into me. And so, uh, I embraced that from a very young age. Um, in fact, uh, I was sort of, I would say, arrogant, but I, I thought children my age, when I was six and seven years old, were too childish. Uh, because what I found fascinating was hanging out with my grandfather, right? So, and my grandfather was the one that taught me all these rituals that would show me um, how to do this and that, uh, that would tell me Nazi stories by the open fireplace at night, eating roast corn over the fire. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my most fondest set of memories that would give us these medicinal baths, keep away, you know, negative evil spirits periodically for my brother and I. And so, and, and many much more uh, that my grandfather shared with me. And it's, 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 it's interesting that he passed away only months after I came to the United States with my mother. Mm. And, and when he passed away, uh, I think I was probably one of the first persons he came to visit in my dream. He came to me 
And so I knew my grandfather was always with me and will be always with me. And it's not only he, because, you know, I speak to him, you know, in my dreams. And he tells me that he's simply representative for all the other people that, that, are, that, are, that are behind him from Benin and from Ghana. And so uh, he's, he's a spokesperson, you know, for them. Yes. Um, and so that engagement continues because, again, you know, spiritual culture and, and material world are tightly braided. You know, they can't be disentangled as if you would disentangle a quilt. And that reality to me is one of the most important um, contributions that the African world has to offer this world. Um, is, 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 is how tightly woven and bounded these aspects of, of human life are. And when you take that holistic view, that's when you begin to start living life. Uh, this, is, this is so insightful, brother, because your work, your public facing work is, is so deeply rooted in ancestors and also in, in carrying that into the living present and the present we experience here. Um, when we come back, we, we're going to look at some of your work um, that as you were talking and even as you opened up with how uh, you spent the last few weeks, um, I, I was coursing through my mind. How were you integrating football in West Africa? And then when you said it was ancestors, it's almost like you gave us a little libation there <laughs> at the beginning. But I said, man, he called me I want to say I say it. <laughs> but but uh, when we come back after the break, uh, if you don't mind, let's talk a little bit about your journey as a man, how you emptied all of this into these spaces and ultimately are really overflowing the boundaries of the Western Academy and really showing us and helping us have uh, find roadmaps to connecting intellectual work to the type of deeply spiritual practices that we need to sustain ourselves and to thrive as a people. We'll be back in a moment here at the Black Table uh, with our brother Kwasi Kanadu, Dr. Kanadu, and uh, we will be back in a moment. See you in a second. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your regular host, Greg Carr, joined today by Dr. Kwasi Kanadu. Uh, when we left, uh, Professor Kanadu, you uh, were describing this connection. And of course, it's very popular these days with the woman king coming out. Folk think they know something about the farm or the homie. Or, but to, to have a connection with Shango and to have that line, brother, and to be led by the spirit. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons we wanted you have to have you on in this initial conversation was to highlight your two most recent books, mm -hmm. um, a book of primary sources, which is remarkable. Africa's Gold Coast through Portuguese sources, 1469 to 1680. And the book, Many Black Women of This Fortress, of course, there's an Adua there as well. Right. Garcia, Monica and Adua, three enslaved women of the Portugal's African Empire. But. Uh, as is your practice and being and, and as you would have us understand all of ours, if we will simply release into it, tap into it and do the work spiritually. So much of what you said so far um, connect in some ways with this remarkable text that you published in 2019, our own way in this part of the world. You have developed a, a, a very, very powerful capacity to listen, to be present. And as you describe your work around uh, Brother Kofi Nanko and his his community himself, a man who you never met, uh, a man, however, who is everywhere except in the archives, which you did something about with this book. Could, could, could you tell us a little bit about how this book reflects uh, your process, your process of deep listening and spiritual work and how these individuals that you've written about, whether it be the, the women and men of the East, one of your earlier books, or Kofi Danko, represent this 
this practice that you're talking about, this this essence of who we are. Can you talk, talk lead us through, you know, some of how this how this book went on all the way as far as the world kind of illustrates some of the things you, you brought up in the first block? Sure thing. In fact, I think the statute of limitation for um, you know, for graduate school work has 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 expired. So I can say this is that since since graduate school work, um, first at Cornell, then at Howard, um, I have always used that space and the resources available in those spaces, you know, to really further my my and deepen my connection with my ancestry. And so, essentially, I've, I've been fronting all these years, <laughs> you know, pretending to to be, um, you know, an academic, yes. when in fact, um, you know, I, I'm I'm just crazy um, deepening and furthering my connection with my ancestry through the work that I do. And so. In many ways, um, I, I met Kofi Donko through my ancestry, uh, and it happened this way. It was 2000 or 2001, where I was still a graduate student at Howard University, and I, you know, was, well, didn't have a topic for dissertation, but I knew I wanted to do something around healing and medicine, and uh, I had a dream where um, I'm walking on this path that that essentially is a clear path, a very clear day. Uh, no one is around, and there's a rock, uh, a smooth rock to my left as I'm walking around this path. And as I hit the turn or the bend of this path, this figure jumps out from un under the rock or behind the rock. And he says to me, dressed in red, <laughs> mm -hmm. he says to me, um, if you want to know more about your great, great, great grandmother, that's Ajwa Kunadu, right? Um, you have to go to Ghana. And she's the one who came from the Gold Coast, present day Ghana. And so that's what I did. And so the rest has pretty been history. And so when I when I got there, I didn't know anyone. My, my, my chi was very basic, greetings and so on. But what I did do, um, I just I just listened, you know, and in terms of intuition. And nowadays, you know, the, this 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 subspecies of, of, of um, scholars called scientists uh, <laughs> have, have been saying that intuition is a higher form of thinking. But actually, it isn't. It's not. It's not thinking. Mm. It's listening and hearing, and there's a difference between listening and hearing, right? Yes, yes. And so um, you can hear, which means you can you can use your auditory senses, but listening is hearing and doing, right? It's hearing and acting on. And so what I did when I when I when I heard and saw that message, I acted on it, and I got a I got a ticket right away on what was then called Ghana Airways. It's now defunct, unfortunately, mm. but I got I got on that Ghana Airways, you know, flight. And made my way to Kotoka National International Airport in Accra, the capital of Ghana. And I went first to uh, Kofodja in the eastern region, to Ayoko, a small village, um, to where, you know, my first stop, uh, which was through uh, some people I knew in D.C. who had a connection. And from there, I went to Kumasi through um, to stay with a family of a brother I met um, who worked in a school where I taught in D.C., and he provided janitorial staffing for that school. And so um, he hooked me up with his family, stayed there for a few days. And then in those days, you know, th th there really wasn't any telecommunicate system in place. You had to buy a card and put it into public pay phone. And the calls, the calls were routed through Europe and they came back to Ghana. <laughs> and you could hear the pause, right? Yes. And so the infrastructure wasn't in place. And so I would just call, leave a message at a fax machine center in Techiman. And hopefully the person would get the message and hopefully call me back in a, in a time that I would also be next to a phone, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> in those days, the process was much more, more, much more complicated and much more trickier. But I made it there and I and I and and um I later found out the person who I encountered was the son, one of the sons of Kopi Dunkel. Mm. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And um, he and I started to connect. I had a letter from my friend Anna Kwekwasechi in Florida, who introduced me to the family. Um, come to find out that was Kofi Donko's family. I was in the compound. I stayed there um, in the compound. And um, that's also where Kofi Donko is resting in place because traditionally the Akan people used to bury um, their, their elder, elder households at least you know, within the compound um, in one of the rooms. Mm -hmm. um, they would not be placed into a cemetery away from the family compound. And so um that's where he that where he rests is where I stayed in our compound. And so um I, I met Kobe Donko in spirit, but not in person. Hmm. And I, as I kept, you know, walking around the town and you know making introductions and following my way through trying to learn the language, I would tell people that who want to speak to me in English that do not speak to me at all. Um I, I want to speak only in chi. And that's really how I began learning is by forcing people not to speak to me in English. Hmm. Um 
And so I would pick up little by little, you know, over the years and get better at it. My questions became better. Uh, my probing came better. And even though I wasn't concerned with Kopi Donko per se, he was omnipresent. He was always around because wherever, whoever I spoke to, they would mention him. Mm. And so ultimately, to make the short story shorter, you know, over 10 years of doing this work in Ghana and having maybe three or four books published, um, the time was right for me to start writing that book. And so I started writing the book for Kofi Donko in 2017. Um, mm -hmm. this, is, this is after about 15 years of just deep digging and research and, you know, sort of suturing together these fragments, you know, that I found along the way. So you asked a question about methods and my methods is driven by intuition. Um, you know, I don't have a research plan that's 20 pages long. I don't have a detailed, you know, sort of, of outline about what it is I want to accomplish and, you know, what are my delimitations and variables. All that stuff is really in my head and in my body. And so mm -hmm. the way that I proceed is that I have a certain kind of sense about um, a problem or an unresolved question. And what I want to do is I want to toss that question or problem in as many ways as possible. Think of the problem as, let's say, chicken, right? Yes. Because chicken is ubiquitous. I want to barbecue it. I want to rotisserie it. I want to fry it. I want to <laughs> fricassee it. I want to, I, I want to essentially, you know, angle that question or, or problem in so many ways to get the most, flush the most out of it. I want to see from all the particular angles that are possible, that are plausible, mm -hmm. so that I can see what kinds of evidentiary materials are needed to essentially satisfy the demands of the question or the um, problem itself. I also want to do is I want to separate, um, you know, when I look through the sources that come out of that question or that problem, I want to separate observation from interpretation. So what you find is that people will read a source, particularly myself, we read a source from the 18th, 19th century, in the case of Kofi Donko, 19th, 20th century, mm -hmm. and all sources are biased because they have to be. They come from a particular point of view, right? Yes, sir. And so uh, I don't look for bias. What I look for is I read between and against the grain. Uh, I, I look for things that are silences and disclosures. I look for as I fricassee and fry and barbecue, I'm looking for all those things to, to, to run out, uh, to pour out essentially. And as they pour out, I then have to separate observation and interpretation. So if somebody says, look, um, we met these healers in the early 20th century in a place called uh, Akuyapong um, or Akompong. And um, these healers said this and that. I said, okay, well, that language is in German, right? And I know yeah. German, German uh, as a language has a certain structuration um, but I also know that it has uh, a certain vocabulary because these are recorded by missionaries, right? German Swiss missionaries. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the layers that I have to work through as, as, as a scholar and as a story. What I mean by barbecue, frying, frequency, I got to work through these layers. They're missionaries, they're Swiss missionaries, they're Basel missionaries, they're German missionaries, right? They're mm -hmm. Protestant missionaries. Mm -hmm. And so I got to look at all these layers and I look at, well, first of all, they're listening to Chi, translating into German, and then I'm translating from tree to German back to English, right? So I had to think about the entire sweep of translations and what can go wrong and what can go right, right? <laughs> and so these are technicalities that perhaps most people don't think about, but I do, and I pay attention to all of them. And so I'll say, for example, as I did in the book, I was in this part of the world that readers have to be mindful that I am translating from 19th century German, which was a translation from 19th century chi to German into 21st century English, right? And yeah, in that yeah. process, there are certain things that the German could not compute or understand or grasp because their vocabulary didn't have the um, the receptors to receive a concept like obusumfo. There's nothing in German to receive and be able to grasp that concept, right? Mm. There's, there's nothing in German, 19th German for bayi, which some people translate roughly as witchcraft, but it's, it's, it's not that, right? Yeah, and so I have to guide the reader. Say, hey, this is the process that I'm working through, and I need you to, to stay with me because if you stay with me, you and you get to the other side, which is the side of comprehension, right? Right? Then you know why I'm interpreting this text that way, or why I'm interpreting this song that way. So there's a, there's a there's a there's a refrain that these that these women sing, um, having this festival by the Beza missionary in the town called Inkranza, where Kopi Donko was born in the village of Kunsu Dumasi. And they're basically mocking the, the Basel missionary station who, who said, look, we ban you from playing that kind of drumming and music. And they say, look, we're playing it in front of your face. 
in yeah, front of yeah. your administration and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> this is, oh, I, I, I really hate to pause here, but but uh, we have to, of course, you know, go to our commercial break. But when we come back, please, let's stay in this same rhythm and energy because there's a beautiful symmetry. There are beautiful symmetries to the whole full arc of your work. And, and we see how you enter and exit communities and institutions as is necessary to do the kind of revealing work that you're doing. So let, let's stay in this rhythm when we come back. Uh, we'll be back with our brother, uh, Kwesi Kanadu, here in the Black Table, uh, back in a moment. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Remember to support all of the shows on the Black Star Network. Support the network. Download the app. Tell your friends. Join the Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, as you can see, we're building something here, and it's truly remarkable. Prof, when, when we left, um, you really were helping us by demonstrating. In fact, in many Black women of this fortress, you enter the archive and, and you reveal who these three sisters are, these representative sisters in the 15th and 16th centuries, these Africans who are caught up in uh, the process of uh, expansion, European expansion, and they resist, but that resistance is in the archive and isn't in the archive. And even as you've given us this uh, major source uh, of archival texts in Africa's Gold Coast through Portuguese sources, many of which never appeared in English, you are reminding us in, in the second block there, you reminded us that this is just a point of departure and that you have to uh, to listen. And the Egyptians, as we know, made that distinction between listening and hearing. And, and so when you talk about silences um, the, and, and disclosures and how you listen, you came to the academy with a developed capacity for that, right? I mean, because of your apprenticeships, right? I mean, your first book, Indigenous Medicine and Knowledge in African Society, you know, that it comes right out of that, all those apprenticeships you served, right? And then it's interesting as you listen for ways in which African people have attempted to do the same, even when they didn't have the type perhaps of background, which is why when you wrote A View from the East, it was so important to have a, 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 a memory kept moment where you inscribe the memory of those who were looking for those kind of things as well and their impact. One, if you have any thoughts or any comments on how you have used these institutions, not only to listen, but to act, as you say, to hear, to, to move through the world in action. And how, how has that trajectory shifted over the years? I mean, I don't think I'm sure it's not accidental that that book on the East, which Syracuse University Press published, is now published by your own diasporic African press, <laughs> as is Transatlantic Africa, your, your history of the last several centuries of African people's movements through the world, which starts with Oxford University Press and then in an expanded edition, diasporic African press. Is there I mean, are you spirit led to kind of ground now in these black institutions like the ones you've chronicled and and inscribed and, and how does spirit help guide your your research projects and, and your work? Well, that's a great question. And, and I'm going to disappoint you because the answer is pretty simple. You said it. It's, that's what it is in, in that, you know, I'm driven by by intuition. Um, now, sometimes, you know, there are a few occasions where I don't listen. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, there they, they are. They are. And guess what? My, 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 particularly my grandfather, um, you know, who I've described, um, you know, um, I call him for this purpose, Nana Yao. He's born on Thursday. Sure. Um, but my grandfather, um, yeah, he, he remind me that, that, you know, he would tell me, for example, that don't ask questions you already know the answers to. So sometimes they'll admonish me, um, but I know they always have my back, you know. Um, I'll tell you something else, and then I'll, I'll circle back to, you know, the, the 
sort of question. I right, take uh, your time, brother. This is this is this is where, where's what we wanted from. <laughs> to lay out. I was in Benin in 2005, and again, I didn't realize why I was there. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in Benin in 2005. But it's, it felt it felt like home. And um, you know, I went to I was in Cotonou, the capital. I was in Abome, um, um, Cotonou, and a few other places. But but while in Cotonou, I was staying in the residence where I was in. Actually, I was leading a group of students, uh, a lead faculty for a group of students. We spent two weeks in Benin, two weeks in Ghana. You know, one of the, one of the best dual trips I've done before. Now I've done several of them, study abroad, but this one was really cool. Nonetheless, I'm 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 sleeping, um, you know, in the residence um, where we stayed in Cotonou. And uh, I had a dream, you know, um, a particular night. And when I woke up, I wrote the dream down. The dream went something like this. Several ancestors came to me. It was a group of them, actually, uh, which I had not seen before. Usually it's, a, it's an old man uh, or a woman or both. But this time it was a group of them. And they came to me and said, we really like what you're doing, but you have to do more. Wow. They said, we have to teach the world about African spirituality and culture. Then they left. And so that's 2005. <laughs> that's and, 2005, right? Yeah, right, right. Hey, and, so yeah, listen, you all go <laughs> to Kwasi Kanadu dot info. Yeah. The dozens of articles, a dozen books, own published company. They told you in 2005. 2005. And so um, that was a year after I finished up at Howard. That was a year after, two years before the medicine book came out. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's what my life's work has been about. It's definitely, it's definitely my, the arc of my life work is definitely about, you know, the, the thriving of African people in the world, right? Yeah. Um, and that we don't have to cannibalize each other. We all can eat. Um, and indeed, um, to do that, you know, my, my argument to us and, and, and to them is, is that our, our power base, our, our, our nuclear weapon uh, without the corrosive side effects is our spiritual culture because it is the analog to the digital, you know, disaster that yeah. we live in. Yeah. And so uh, when they said that to me, it just made it clear. It mapped everything out for me. Um, and I knew that that's why I had to be there in Benin 2005, right? Mm -hmm. um, I haven't met the Hogun, like the head the head leader of the Vodun for the entire nation. As you know, Benin um, um, has Vodun and Catholicism as national um, religions for Catholicism and national spiritual systems for Vodun. Yeah. And so I, I met the head of Goon in Cotonou, um, and, and he gave me a talisman, in fact, um, and, and, and you know, he was very generous to me. Mm -hmm. I met others, you know, that, that were there. And so it really, really um, was, was a form of homecoming. But I didn't realize the magnitude of it until I started actually doing more of that kind of work. So every project I've done has been the first of its kind. And I'm not boasting or bragging. It's just no, 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 it no, is. No. Can, can, can uh, I interject here? Just yes, back. yes, yes. No, no, no. Your, your book on the East. And, and we are both children of the Pan-African Nationalist Movement. And for mm -hmm. those who, uh, we, this is just the opening of the way. We, we looking forward to having you back a number of times. When you mentioned the brother who was at the school you were working at, um, who had the connection in Ghana. Of course, that, that is a way open. And we're going to, and you all mark this now, Council of Independent Black Institutions. We're going to talk about those African-centered schools in a minute. So there's footnotes to everything we've been in this conversation. But, but when you, you know, there's a generosity not only your spirit, but in the way that you inscribe. And, and, and when you tell the story of the East, it is absolutely, as James Turner says in the introduction, and then as, as our brother and your, your, your brother, Scott Brown, in particular, mm -hmm. says in, the, in just the second edition, there's a generosity of spirit in helping bring to the world the story of this living community of folk who are about building community and sustaining community and protecting community. I mean, is that, you know, that generosity that you exhibit, including the fact that your ancestors have your back, clearly. <laughs> we, we're not going to let you out here. You It reminds me, of, again, I, I mentioned Gerald Horn. Yeah. Calls it ruthless synthesizing when he <laughs> and just consumes that. But, yeah. but in many ways, you remind me generationally of uh, one of the great elders, of course, Toyin Falola, as we talk about, mm -hmm. guided by this spirit, man, this sustaining thing. I mean, is that what led you in those first couple of projects, the, the medicinal piece, and then the East? And mm -hmm. such a powerful institution. Can you say a few words about those first couple of books and, and how this kind of exhibits what you've been talking about? Sure thing. Um, well, the, the medicine book came out of my dissertation. Um, this is more work afterwards, but that came out of the dissertation work. And that, again, was firmly ancestor because the first healer and the foremost healer in, in my heart, in my, in my spirit, is my grandfather. And so he was, he was, he's all over that book. 
Mm -hmm. um, I first came to learn about medicines and about plant life. In fact, the, the, the sort of, um, you know, um, street language for healers in Jamaica, they call them bush doctor. <laughs> because because they, they live in plants. Uh, and so did my great grandmother and her mother and, and, and their mother and, and so on and so forth lived in plants. And that's really where the power is. The power is in action in medicines. Mm -hmm. um, and so that book definitely was, was my grandfather's all over that. Um, and then, of course, the East, um, that was very much, you know, part of, you know, my time with uh, another elder who's now an ancestor. Dr. James Turner, um, um, he uh, was like another father to me. Um, but guess what? He he had that same effect on thousands of people. Yes. And, and as I said, one of his you know tributes panels that we did for him, I don't know how he did that. Made people feel as if he was their father, <laughs> without without ever taking away time and effort from his own biological children. Right. Yes. How he could be a father for thousands and do so for his own. Mm -hmm. To me, that seemed to be you know, sort of the, the impossibilities of impossibilities. We, we got one more break. And when we come back, we're going to continue this conversation. So uh, we're going to take our final break here at the Black Star Network on the Black Table with Dr. Chrissy Kanadu. This is uh, his first moment at the table, but we are going to claim for the elders and ancestors that it won't be his last. We're going to have a conversation as you see. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with our final session uh, seg segment here at the Black Table for this session. Back in a moment. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. We feel the hidden impacts of climate change that land harder in black, brown, and native communities. Not many people talk about it because they clearly don't know our lives. But with President Biden's landmark infrastructure and climate plans, our issues are finally seen. Removing lead pipes means we know our water is safe. Cutting carbon pollution helps our kids breathe easier. 1.5 million new jobs mean stable work in communities. The impact we need. Right now. Welcome back to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Uh, I'm your regular host, Greg Carr. And please support the network, support all the shows. Join the Bring the Funk fan club. Download the app. Tell your friends. We're on many platforms and about to be on many more. So stay tuned. Uh, we're going to finish up this section with uh, our brother, Dr. Kwesi Kanadu. Um, when we left, you really helped frame. In fact, you framed why, why this intellectual work is done. It's done for us in these in these in these recent texts and there's so many things by the way i just pulled a few of the ones diaspora african press i hope you'll say a word about that this is that book of course on james turner uh discourse on africana studies that that you published with the press that you started um you had a number of projects in the works and i'm wondering if you could say something uh about you know, how you work kind of simultaneously. I know Empires of Gold is coming out, History of African Diasporas, People's History of Jamaica, the Transatlantic Slaving Diet. Those who don't look at the world the way that you look at it would say, this man is a remarkably prolific scholar. But it seems almost as if this work is just like a, a as a consequence of the real work. <laughs> that you came into this. Can you talk a little bit about even that, even these, these future projects and how they connect to what you've done to date? Sure thing. It seems like you've been tapping the recipe. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, brother. I'm gonna... <laughs> this, uh, look, you're giving us life. All <laughs> these young people, they listen to this. Yeah. This, is, this is transformational, Bob. Mm -hmm. Please, please. <laughs> well, definitely. Well, um, what, what folks, you know, that, that are viewing that will view this, um, you know, may not appreciate or recognize is that um, I spend even more time and energy, you know, on, on being a father. Uh, and, mm. and so um, how is that possible to do all these things? Well, you said it. I mean, you, you have the secret sauce or recipe if there is a secret. 
which is that, um, you know, uh, what are my values? You know, what I value, I value my family, my children, you know, I value obviously uh, my people, uh, you know, spiritual culture and all that, all that, all that it pertains to all that matters. And so once you have that GPS, once you have those coordinates, you know, everything else sort of falls in place and simple. So I, I personally, you know, for me, in terms of short biography, I've never drank, I've never smoked, I don't do drugs, you know, I don't fornicate, I don't, you know, do those kinds of things. And so it keeps me much more disciplined and focused on what really matters. And that, and that to me is people, first of all, my family and then my people. Um, and in doing so, um, it's not surprising that I have not only the energy, but also the, the, the focus and the to do it. And by to do it, I mean, you got to get it done at some point, right? Sure. And so um, I'm able to get it done because um, most of these work is, 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 is they, they, they bleed into each other. And so, for example, the work of the press, Diaspora Africa Press, um, you know, Diaspora Africa Press, you know, that work is an extension of my own scholarship, though it's separate from my scholarship, right? Um, and the, my scholarship is an extension of, you know, my, my healing work in, in the sense that that's my compass when, when I, when I look into or go into a project or go into an archive or go into a community is I'm thinking about, okay, what, what, what's, what's, what's driving me here? What's motivating me here? Um, and let me put that into some, you know, concrete form, uh, to be able to tell the story that needs to be told, you know, for the broader African world and the benefit of the African world. And so, um, and that spirit, of course, that drives me is, is baked in ancestry. And so um, one of the um, recent uh, projects that I've embarked on, and some might think I'm extending myself, but it's not, because these are just really extensions of, of this package that I am, which is, um, there's a YouTube channel that I've started recently called Powered by Ancestry, not surprisingly. Excellent, and, yes. And, yes. And, and, and that came from my ancestors saying that, hey, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep doing this. And so it's a way in which to for me to distill a lot of my work into into, into plain language, um, digestible portions of about episodes which form no more than fifteen to seventeen minutes apiece. Wow. Um, given the attention spans and 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 the demands on people's attentions um, in digital world that we um, inhabit, um, and so power by ancestry, um, the reception so far far has been uh, pretty good. Uh, I'm not focused on numbers <laughs> um, per se. I'm focused on whoever checks it in and that's who I'm feeding. And um, if they feel inclined, they can share with others and then they, they too will be fed. So the positive feedback so far has been been great, but I'm, I don't do it for that. I'm doing it for ancestry. And so um, Power by Ancestry has really been another outgrowth of the publishing, of the healing work, of the scholarship, where I can put those all together and put them in one place that is accessible, that is distilled, and that people can come to and tap anytime, you know, for uh, whatever their needs may be, that channel may fill. Uh, and then in terms of new projects, you mentioned Empires of Gold. That book is finished. It was finished actually in November. I finished writing it. Hmm. That, 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 that's the next big book. And, I, and this may sound, um, for those that know my work, uh, hyperbolic, but that's probably my best book so far. Really? Yeah, 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 here, brother. That now that <laughs> that's a yeah. hell of a <laughs> you yeah. Say, you yeah. it's, it's, it's 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 heavy. In fact, in tree, you say emudu uh, is deep. But that 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 one is is my probably my best work so far. But guess what? You, you, go um, yeah. I haven't crest yet. <laughs> no question. Oh well, no, there yet. is no crest. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't well, crest yet. Like that. So like far, that. and 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 really. Uh, I thought about it within myself. I said, I thought our way in this part of the world was the best one. And it is um, that I've done so far because it was so much 15 years going into that one. And not to say that others have been shortchanged because they haven't been, but and this it, one. For purposes, many black women are this fortunate, as I told you before we started. Yeah. It's so yeah. powerful because you're bringing these sisters to life as representative mm -hmm. figures. I mean, it's really right. pushing back. We, we talked to Howard French a few months ago and mm -hmm. with uh, Born in Blackness. But this is something different. You're anchored in us in a different way. So I mean, so but anyway, so so differently, perhaps all these different people. But this empires of gold, you say, yeah, it yeah, just, it's, 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 it's just a hit different on this side. Of the yeah, yeah, that that, that one, and, and of course, you know, I, you know, the um, book on the black woman that you had in your hand a moment ago. Yeah, yeah. That one, I didn't plan that one, but the but the sister um, Grasa. Uh -huh. um, I, only, I only know a Portuguese name, um, which I think it means um, beloved one or, or related one. Um, Grasa, she was talking to me 
um, I, I came upon her inquisitional file and it's a difficult, you know, hand, it's a gothic hand that, that's written in. Um, but, and it's short, really. It's about 20, 25 folios. Um, um, but she was speaking to me and, 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 and I had to do it. And so I kept on working and it was difficult, it was tough. But as I'm working through it, you know, then I came upon Monica's file. This is sort of the, the, the order of sequence. Yeah. And then Ajua, Ajua's one was in passing. Actually, all I know of Ajua is a name. It has a name in passing, but that one's about method, which is to say, hey, you lazy scholars or people who pretend to be scholars that claim that the sources aren't there, we have to fabulate or, or make things up. No, you don't have to make things up. You need to know how to do this kind of work, and I'm going to show you how. No question. And, and I say this with all humility, right? <laughs> right. And, and guess what? Guess what, you know, Brother Greg? Yes, sir. Charles don't do that. They don't, they don't, they don't publish their, their, their work. They keep it to themselves and hoard it. Yes, sir. I'm saying, look, you can check me if you think, <laughs> if you have questions about what I do and how I do it. In fact, I'm going to feed you because I know you don't read these sources. I know you don't do this kind of work, but I'm going to feed you and students who would need this nourishment. I'm going to put it out to say, hey, if you want to, if you want to test me, if you want to check me, if you want to challenge me on how I do what I do, here you go. Here you go. Right? Here you go. Here's, here's, here's a gift for you. But yeah. more importantly, that those sources to me are crucial because the Portuguese are the first European um, empire that had the most sustained contact in Western Africa up until the 17th century. And yet there was nothing on the former Gold Coast or Mina Coast about them available in English. Yes, there were some scattered things here and there, but nothing of this magnitude. Not it only changed the entire... The entire <laughs> The entire history of what we thought about this sort of so-called early modern period of the Gold Coast, but also yeah. Portugal and the empire, because 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 these are intertwined history. In other words, I remember a student asking me in my modern African history class, why do we have to tell tell the story of Africa with the Europeans? I said, well, they're part of the story. You can't leave them out, you know. And so they're part of the story. And so whoever the actors are, they have to be told part of the story. Uh, whatever, whatever your disdain may be, you know, for 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 their acts and their intent, yes. they're part of the story. Yes. And what I'm saying, in other words, is that the story of Portugal and its empire is recasted now, right? Yeah. Um, in many different, in many ways, that empires of gold does that job. Ah. And empires of gold, um, you know, takes its, its its sources from about 16 countries. Hmm. <laughs> archives it takes it so it spans really it's a it's, it's african history and rural history married yes <laughs> you know in, in fact let, that's a good place for us to kind of uh bring this this session to a pause until the next time that we talk and first of all um as you were talking i, I pulled it up everybody needs to go to powered by ancestry like you say i mean it, it's so that we can connect and we're gonna we're gonna you know stress that from here on in, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see it myself here. Um, finding your people, it looks like he just posted that's the latest one, so we gotta, yeah. we gotta do that. But in terms, you know, Ch as we know, Chancellor Williams, of course, mm -hmm. said, you know, this all this work has to be done by teams. Mm -hmm. and, and given the fact that even in your relative youth, it, it, to date, uh, all the languages, all the travel, all the connecting, all the ability to translate through layers and then bring people into conversation with each other, ancestors, those right now, and then speaking to the to the future. How important is it, particularly as I think about young people looking at this, how important is it for us to build community mm -hmm. and work like this? Because you're absolutely right, man. The West, it's all about getting out there first and hiding it from everybody until. <laughs> and, and so it, it, it is, as what is it? Uh, Ikwe Omar may say in, in 2000 season, that's spring water flowing to the desert, brother. <laughs> what right, 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 right. <laughs> I mean, how Indeed. important is it for us to, the, the spirit of generosity that you exhibit, I mean, how do people, how should people think about this in terms of connections and, and you want know, to work together? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it goes back to a saying that I mentioned a moment ago, which which I firmly hold dear, which is that we don't have to cannibalize each other, right? We 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 we, we peoples of African ancestry, for lack of a better phrasing or term, um, you know, uh, certainly have our intra-African um, you know challenges, uh, but we also have a lot of beauty and 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 gifts and connections that need to be played up. To say that you know we don't need to cannibalize each other, that we can all eat, and so that spirit of generosity is essentially saying, "Hey, here's my platter contribution to that table where we can all eat." Yes. And so um, you know, there, there's nothing you know that I do that is done out of any 
you know, selfish motive or because I want to, you know, prom receive promotion or tenure, which I already have, but right. that, 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 that's not my motive, you know, uh, never was my motive. In fact, I, I declined one time I was offered a chair position. Um, I declined it because I, I don't want to do that. I want to be able to get in, do my thing and get back to my family and what I care about. Yes. Um, and so the the sort of you know generosity spirit that you refer to um to me that is the motive force but the generosity also has to be also protective right of yes, itself sir. yes sir. Um, because it can be abused it can be taken advantage of it can be um misused um and so it has to be uh, always um generous but also um guarded uh, against you know those uh, forces that would want to either use it for its own purposes or uh, make it into something that it's not. And so to me, th th that that is the message for young people, including my, my daughters who are 12 and 14, mm -hmm. um, it, it, is that, you know, the, the key to life is staying who you are, but you can't stay who you are if you don't know who you are. Yes. Uh, in other words, you, you, you can't stay on a balance beam, you know, uh, if you don't know how to balance. Mm -hmm. And that balancing act is between this, you know, physical material world and and, and, and the spiritual one. Right. And um, th this is this is what I'll, I'll close it on my part. If it's time to close, is that, um, you know. The vehicle is our physical human body, blood, plasma, brain, et cetera, mind. Uh, that's the vehicle. Um, the spirit is the driver of that vehicle mm -hmm. and the GPS is the ancestry because they came before us and they know where we're going because they they, they they know the roads because they built it. Yes. Yes. I think um, I'm going to say less and let that resonate. That as Egyptians would say, Medu Nefer, that's good speech <laughs> there, brother. So listen, we can't thank you enough for joining us in this inaugural motion. And we hope you'll come back soon. We want to get you some time, get some time, more time with you. Uh, even though it's a finite resource, I guess, and, and <laughs> maybe it's not a finite resource as we, as we know. So I say, well, not, not for me. Um, anytime that, that I'll be um, you know, honored to, um, come back. Uh, you let me know. Um, Definitely will. I make time. I make time for those I care about. So <laughs> same here, brother. Same here. <laughs> you love you, brother. And uh, me so, too, so, man. Yes, sir. So y'all go to Kwasi K W A S I Kanadu K O N A D U dot info. Uh, you'll see the information there. Please uh, go to Powered by Ancestry and get this knowledge because that's what I'm gonna be doing. And uh, <laughs> so uh, we, we, we'll we'll, we'll uh, say until next time to you, Professor Kanadu, and thank you, thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. appreciate thank you. it. Absolutely, we'll be back in the here. Oh, you too, you too, Baba, you and the family to everyone. So um, we'll be back here in a moment at the flag table to clear the table, and we will uh, see you in a moment after this break. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. We've spent our hour with a powerful brother, scholar, healer, son, husband, father, a, a real master teacher, institution builder, publisher, who is modeling the way that we can move through the world, powered by our ancestors, Dr. Kwesi Kanadu. Uh, we'll take this moment as we clear the table to reflect on the life of a recent ancestor, Someone who you may not see in the white facing media uh, celebrated the way that he should be celebrated and, and remembered. And that, of course, is a native son, an African uh, born in Richmond, Virginia. And that is the great Randall Robinson. Randall Robinson made transition recently in St. Kitts at the age of 81, the founder of Trans Africa Forum in 1976 and 77. Uh, at one time, chief of staff for Charles Diggs, 
of the Congressional Black Caucus, worked with Bill Clay out of Missouri. Um, his brother, Max Robinson, was the first black anchor of a major news show, uh, ABC. He saw Max Robinson on television back in the 70s. Well, his brother, Ma his brother Randall, uh, like Max, graduate of Virginia Union University, started out at Norfolk State University, went to Harvard and got a law degree, but used that law degree as a weapon for the struggle of African people globally for his entire adult life. Randall Robinson, uh, who made transition recently, is someone who we will devote a future Black Table conversation to. And as we clear the table, we are reminded that when he wrote his book, Quitting America, Randall Robson said that I tried to love America. America never loved me, but I loved my nation in America. And that nation was the black nation and that nation knows no borders. So as I moved to my wife's country of birth, St. Kitts, he went, traveled all over the world from there, including back and forth to the United States. But he said, I am no more an African born in the United States than I am a Haitian, than I am a Nigerian, than I am an African born anywhere else. My country is my people. And he lived that way. So we wish him safe ancestral journey and ancestor protection as he will continue to speak to us. So join us next week here at the Black Table. And we are always grateful. And tell a friend, tell more than one friend, tell the nation it's time to come to the Black Star Network. See you next week. <laughs>